coincide with the publication of their fully peer-reviewed paper on reinforcement learning, DeepMind have released more games from the matches played between AlphaZero and Stockfish. Now, in the last video, we saw how AlphaZero prized peace activity, often over material concerns. And we're going to see that aspect of its style again in this game, but in a very different setting. In that last game, we saw a wild attacking game. Here, this is very different. And this game really reminds me of the way that Magnus Carlsen plays. Okay, let's take a look. Now, this game started from uh, a sequence of opening moves that were set. This is actually an opening variation that was played in the TSEC Championship, that is the Top Chess Engine uh, Championship. So these first uh, eight moves are all book, basically. So what um, DeepMind did was to try uh, and test Alpha Zero in various settings. So sometimes with an opening book, sometimes without, sometimes from set opening positions, so that they could get uh, a more complete picture of, of how Alpha Zero was doing. So this is the starting position that uh, they, they played from. And here, well, for example, Magnus Carlsen has played C4. That was uh, a game against Bereev in 2009. Actually won a very nice attacking game. Um, and we have E takes F6 played uh, in a couple of games. But Alpha Zero played C3, which seems like a very curious looking move because it simply gives up the pawn on E5. Well, as I said, it doesn't mind giving up material if it feels it can activate its pieces. So a very modest follow-up move, rook e1, but it's all about generating activity for its pieces. So you can see this bishop, well, in fact, you know, white's, white's bishops and the rook actually are very active here. And... Black has problems sorting himself out. You can see that knight blocks the bishop there, and there could be problems on the e file. Let's see what happens. Queen c7, and a check. Now, if the pawn comes to g6, then bishop d4 is a little bit awkward, and there'll be suddenly a lot of pressure on e6. So after bishop h5 check, knight g6, and g4. Well, that's kind of an outrageous move, but... Uh, and, and this has consequences because white's king could turn out to be rather weak. Um, you know, if this were if this were one of my pupils playing this game, I'd, I'd be raising an eyebrow here after g4. Let's see, knight b3. But actually, it's about getting white's pieces into play very quickly. Knight d4. So you can see the pressure is already starting to build against that e6 pawn. And b3, obviously not pawn to its knight. That'll as bishop f4 check. So the bishop goes back to a6. And now a very attractive looking move, actually. Bishop f4, exploiting pins on the e-file and on this diagonal too. And castles queenside. So the king actually reaches... Uh, relative safety on the queen side. Now this is a really interesting position where white has uh, a, I think a few plausible alternatives and it's fascinating to see which one alpha zero selects. First of all knight e6 looks very attractive but actually black here could simply give up the queen so at the moment, black has two minor pieces for the queen, uh, but this knight is an absolute monster, and this bishop will soon join the game. Um, this bishop is also sort of left dangling a bit here. Black has tremendous compensation. Even so, you know, you can imagine many chess engines would uh, go for that and find some way to maybe keep the material. But as I said, AlphaZero 
doesn't like it when its opponent is has a lot of activity and it likes peace activity for itself. But this is a very plausible move to take on g6 and play this position. So the queen comes across, um, that seems attractive to me, so that the queen can defend the king. And, you know, this bishop looks pretty good, so the queen can sit on g3. But no, it didn't go for that. Instead, it went for bishop g3. And then started pressing on the queen side. I mean, I find this quite an extraordinary way of playing the position, actually. Um, and if the bishop pops out, then queen c2. But, okay, bishop d6 also looks reasonable. As we're about to see, I think um, alpha zero had in mind a particular end game. And again, this is an interesting moment where it seems as though this move, knight e3, could be quite a reasonable way for white to play the position, uh, because after this, white seems to be reasonably secure on the king side and could well just recover a pawn but clearly thought that this wasn't uh, sufficient to give, well, uh, enough winning chances. Instead went for a very different kind of position. Um, just watch what happens. So in a moment we're going to get a, a big exchange of pieces. And clearly Alpha Zero had foreseen the position that arises on the board and chose this position instead of uh, those, the earlier one I mentioned and, and other continuations. So uh, when I first looked at this position, I was thinking, okay, well, it's just gone wrong here. It's gone into an end game where it's a pawn down. Now it's opposite color bishops. White has control over the E file. Well, you know, white has enough activity to draw, basically. That was my feeling when I first looked at this position. Incredibly, Alpha Zero assesses at this moment that it has a 77%, 70, I can't say it, 77% chance of winning this position. Extraordinary. And, and that shows the incredible judgment that it has. Um, and indeed, as we're about to see, it went on to win this game against Stockfish. A very, very powerful machine. Okay, let's try and understand why white is actually better in this position. And I mentioned the, uh, the comparison with, with Magnus Carlsen. Magnus often likes to get this kind of control in a position where he's only playing for two results, either a win or a draw. So first of all, as I mentioned before, white has control over the one clear open file in the position. That's very important. So obviously rook takes pawn being met by rook e8 and mate. So the rook comes back. So black is actually quite passive here. Also, I think we should mention that black's king is very poor. That it really can't come out of its box here. Uh, not just because of the bishop, but because of the seventh rank as well. Now, what about this extra pawn? Well, it's not really going anywhere because white's pawns on the queen side are just beautiful and press black's uh, queen side and the king really isn't coming out. So once we see it in that light, that this extra pawn really doesn't have any significance and white's pieces are all very active, then we can start to think, okay, yep, maybe white can press here, but how? And yeah, even optically, it seems just really strange. Um, but let's see what happens. Given what happened in the game, um, black played h5 here. Maybe d4. I just wonder. Now, white is going to take that pawn. But at least in this case, the bishop is on a slightly better square. I don't know, maybe that's a better way of defending. I have no idea. Obviously, white would be better there, though. So let's see what happens. Bishop e5. 
So this bishop is obviously on a superb square on d4 where it uh, controls diagonal here, also looks down here, which is very nice. And now here's the point that white's king can play very actively and target the pawn on g6. Now that pawn is well protected, not least by the bishop on f5. So how on earth is white going to make progress here? Let's find out. At the moment seems to be nothing much going on, but little by little white is strengthening the position. Now here is one of those cases where black has a very difficult uh, decision to make. You will see in a moment how white played, managed to play a6. Should black play a6 here, which really cripples those queenside pawns, but does prevent white breaking with a6 himself? It's really hard to know. And if white tries to double on the seventh, like this, then black can offer an exchange of rooks. Now, can white win this position? I'm not sure. One idea, as we'll see in the game, is to sacrifice an exchange here. And considering that black's king is so far away, then maybe that's a way to try and win. Um, maybe one has to wait first. To, I mean, who knows? Maybe bring the king over to the queen side, if that's possible. But that's a fundamental decision that black has to make. And the kind of decision that we often see in Magnus's games, where his opponents simply don't know what the best defense is, um, and, and, and often it can have fatal consequences. So let's see, rook c8 played, and now a6. So this opens up black's king, opens up the, the seventh rank. Now if b6, Actually, the problem is that this pawn is a little bit weak now. So rook f7, we want to double on the 7th, which would be fatal. So that has to be met by rook e8. And after the exchange, you can see c6 is a problem because if rook c8, we can exchange and king takes and that pawn flies through. Okay, let's come back here. So this pawn was taken. Now, this is quite believable that white is winning. I think once white conquers the seventh rank, then this looks really unpleasant because not only does black have to take care of his king, but there are now weak pawns on a6, c6, and g6 as well, even though that seems very well protected. But just watch what happens, how Alpha Zero manages to kind of just shuffle beautifully. Rook A2, well, that needs to be defended. And we'll see that this bishop is actually gets caught between defending on this diagonal and defending on this one. Let's see what happens. There's a bit of jiggling and shuffling first. That keeps control on the e-file. Bishop comes back, wants the best of both worlds to defend along both. This is almost a kind of Zugzwang position, actually. And white is still just creeping forward. Now, let me show you one possibility. What happens if black just waits here? Okay, let me try this. So here, seems as though nothing has really changed much, but let's see. So now there's a threat to play rook a7 and take here. So we play here. Now, c4, this is an interesting idea. And after this, bishop e5. And this diagonal is now closed to the bishop. And rook takes a6 will be fatal. So that's the kind of idea that's in the air in the position. So white 
can make progress. And this leaves this pawn weakened. So let's see how white managed to exploit that. So this bishop, as I said, it's caught between two diagonals. And now it can't come back on this one because that is covered. The king improves. And now this is very nasty because rook g6 is threatened. But of course, the bishop can't come back because of the threat to c6. And this is an interesting moment. Of course, it's possible to take straight away, but watch what happens. You can see that there's a problem here. The rook would get to f8. So instead, alpha 0 just improves the position first. So that prevents a rook coming to the f-file, that's important. And now that bishop still can't play to c2 because of the c6 pawn is on prees. So let's see what happens now. Now it goes in. And this is clearly lost because the rook can't appear on f8. And this is very, very strong. So as a kind of distraction, of course this is on prees as well, as a distraction, d4 was played, but it doesn't make any difference at all. Just remember, a few moves ago, white was a pawn down. Now he's two pawns up. I mean, this is now completely lost. I don't quite understand why a third pawn was given up, but it, it really makes no odds in the position. White is, is uh, winning <clears throat> very comfortably now. We'll just go to the end of the game. So white is putting all these pieces on nice squares before advancing. Yeah, so the bishop on d4 will help to support the pawn coming to f6. Well, three pawns, three extra pawns is obviously just way too much. Um, I think we can see in that final position how this bishop has been pushed back and forth and restricted in its activity. Um, I think that was an absolutely superb game. And as I said, quite a contrast to um, the previous game we saw, which was a wild attacking game. But it, it was all about peace activity. Uh, more games from this match coming up soon. Uh, watch out for them, and I think we can all learn a great deal from AlphaZero.